Good afternoon. My name is Dam Kinnahill, the library, and I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about medieval and early modern manual communication in Europe. So, sign language. Uh, as I said, my name is Dam Kinnahill, the library. I'm a Laurel out of the Kingdom of the West, and my background is in linguistics, uh, specializing kind of in dead languages. I also have a bachelor's degree in linguistics, so that's kind of where that excitement got started. Uh, as a caveat, please note that I am not a deaf individual, uh, nor am I a user of sign language as a primary form of communication. I do know a little bit, um, but I'm, I'm still very much a beginner. So let's get into what we're talking about. Let's start with some definitions. Uh, so what is a sign language? A sign language is a language that uses what's called a visual manual modality to convey meaning. So you're using, the, the users are using their eyes and their hands, uh, sp manual specifically here meaning hands, but it does incorporate a sort of broader range of body movements uh, to convey meaning. Whereas a spoken language, it uses your voice and your ears to convey uh, sort of the same idea. Oh, that's a right click. So what's the difference between a sign language and a symbolic gestural communication? Sign language is a robust lexicon, includes nouns, determiners, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, etc. It's a very multifaceted grammar that indicates the relationship, that allows the user to indicate the relationship between symbols to express very complex ideas. And you can sort of combine and recombine these symbols in an infinite number of ways to, to, to express any number of concepts and ideas. Signs can be either partially or fully iconic, or they can be arbitrary. So an iconic sign is a sign, it's like an onomatopoeia in a spoken language. So the sign gives you a visual cue as to what you're talking about. So and a great example of this is the sign for moose. Uh, moose is formed by making the hands uh, into sort of when, like when you count to five, you hold all five fingers spread out and you put your thumbs at your temples and then you extend your hands up and away from your head sort of at the same time as if you're indicating larger antlers. So that's the sign for moose. It's very iconic. It gives you a visual cue as to the word that it's trying to convey. An arbitrary sign doesn't have that visual cue. So a great example of this is the sign for uh, name, which is where you have sort of two fingers extended in that sort of blessing sign as you see in early medieval art, but with the thumbs down and you tap the two fingers together in sort of an X shape. So that's the sign for name. There's no visual cue there, so it's an arbitrary sign. What is symbolic gestural communication? This is going to be important a little bit later. Symbolic gestural communication uses a much simpler lexicon that encompasses only those concepts relevant to the situation in which it arises. So a great example of this today is dive sign, where you have a very small number of signs compared to the number of words in, in language. Um, to indicate to talk about just really specific ideas that occur in diving situations so you don't have words for example for train because hopefully you will never run into a train while diving in the ocean or a lake uh, or a swimming pool in all cases no trains uh, you have very few verbs you have a minimal or non-existent independent grammar so you use the sort of underlying grammar of the language that's spoken by the majority of people in this situation to indicate to string together symbols. So if you've got a diving group that's primarily English speaking, you're gonna rely on English grammar when you're using grammar at all, when you're using more than a few signs at a time. Also, signs tend to be very iconic. If I remember correctly, the sign for shark and dive sign is you make a sort of blade of your hand and you put it to your forehead as if to indicate the fin of a shark. So it's, it's very iconic uh, 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 signs. So now that we've defined some terms, let's talk about pre-medieval examples or pre-medieval discussions of sign language. The oldest example in the Western canon is probably Plato's Cratylus, in which uh, Socrates says, if we hadn't a voice or a tongue and wanted to express things one to another, wouldn't we try to make signs by moving our hands, head, and the rest of our body, just as people who cannot speak do at present? A later example comes from the Gospel of Luke, where here they're talking about Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, who had been struck mute for his disbelief. And then they made, and they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And it's interesting to note here the Greek word that's being translated as signs in this sentence means to nod or to communicate uh, without words. So it, it is signs as we are understanding it today. This isn't sort of a, a complex, or not complex, excuse me. This is not an archaic term. This is as we understand sign today. 
So we've, we've talked about uh, definitions, we've talked about pre-medieval history, let's get into what we know about medieval sign languages. Unfortunately, we don't know a whole lot. A lot of what we do postulate about how people communicated using uh, signs in the medieval period is based on our study of modern people who either, or early modern people who have either developed what's called a home sign system or village sign languages. So a home sign system is typically developed when you have hearing parents raising a deaf child or deaf children in isolation from the deaf community. So this is uh, people who do not have access today to American Sign Language. Um, they might develop just within their family unit a, a, a sort of lexicon of signs that aren't necessarily reflective of anything beyond what their family expects them to mean. Nancy Frischberg did some research on this in the late 1980s and identified four ways in which home signs differ from sign language. Specifically, they don't have a consistent meaning to symbol relationship. They don't typically pass generation to generation. Uh, they don't, uh, they aren't shared by one large group. It's just sort of within that family and they're not considered the same over a community of signers. So it's important to note though that more recent studies have shown that these systems do develop some more robust, robust linguistic features as the child users age. Just like you see with spoken language where you have a, a young child learns to speak at a young age and doesn't and the language that they're using then is not as linguistically robust as you will see as they get older. Village sign language is more linguistically complex than home sign and is typically found in communities with an increased incidence of congenital deafness. The complexity does kind of, there is a correlation between the type of congenital deafness and the complexity and uh, sort of percentage use by the population of the village sign language. So if you have a recessive congenital deafness, you tend to have a slightly less complex, linguistically complex uh, sign language, and it's used by fewer members of the community where you have a, a higher incidence, or a, sorry, not a higher incidence, where you have dominant congenital deafness. It's a more linguistically complex language because you have more users and sort of more members of the hearing community are using the sign language because they have more family members who are deaf. Um, the most famous example of this in the United States is Martha, Martha's Vineyard Sign Language, um, which we are going to talk about again a little bit later uh, because of its possible relationship to an older sign language in Britain. Um, but it is really neat and it shows up at beginning, if I remember correctly, in the beginning, uh, at the very end of the 18th century and stayed in use in Martha's Vineyard until about 1954. And it is unrelated to American Sign Language. So the one, the type of signed communication that we have the best records of from the Middle Ages is what's called monastic sign language. And it's important to note here that monastic sign language was typically used as an aid to memory or during periods of enforced silence by hearing individuals. So these are not deaf people creating a language for themselves to communicate to their families or between each other. This is hearing people creating a method of communicating when they cannot otherwise speak. So uh, it's better described typically as a system, the, that symbolic, that system of symbolic gestural communication that we defined earlier. Uh, it has a, 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 a smaller lexicon and it's gonna be focused on things around the monastery or in uh, biblical references. The earliest codified lexicon from, comes from Cluny at 1075, though Bede is reputed to have come up with a finger spelling system as early as the eighth century. Syntax, when it's used, typically followed Latin or the dominant local language, and the extant vocabulary lists provide between 52 and 472 signs. If I remember correctly, the median number is about 100, or the, the average number is about 150 signs in one, in one of these vocabularies. So we've talked some, about some definitions, we've talked about the pre-medieval history and what we can, the, the theories that we can put forward on how deaf people came up with languages to communicate between themselves and with their families. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about formalized sign language uh, and deaf education. Don Pedro Ponce de Leon was a Benedictine who established the first school for deaf children of wealthy aristocrats at the monastery of San Salvador de Oña in the late 16th century. He didn't create a sign language, but he may have helped develop a system of manual spelling based on monastic sign language. His education was focused very much on assimilating deaf children to hearing society by teaching them to speak audibly. He was also focused on teaching deaf children to be literate because there was a legal obligation 
for uh, heirs to be literate in order to come into their inheritance. So these children are the children of wealthy aristocrats and in order for them to inherit their parents' estates, they needed to have Spanish literacy. Juan Pablo Bonet, who was sort of his successor, published the summary of the letters and the art of teaching to speech to the mute in 1620. And this is the first published work we have on deaf education, though, as I noted, it is focused on sort of assimilating deaf children into hearing society. In 1666, the English writer Samuel Pepe's noted the use of a village sign language now called Old Kenter sign language between a deaf servant and a hearing employer. And this is particularly interesting because there are some some pretty solid theories that old Kentish sign language may have provided at least some of the foundation for the sign language use on the island of Martha's Vineyard uh, in the United States. And this is based not on the uh, not on any record necessarily of old Kentish sign language because unfortunately we don't have a lexicon of those signs, but rather on looking at patterns of immigration in the history of the two communities to draw a connection. So unfortunately you can see here this is a very thin amount of recorded history of a formalized sign language and of deaf education. It does pick up into the 17th century and the 18th century. You have um, the, the, the rise of old French sign language, uh, which was um, an abbot whose name I've just completely blanked on in Paris. Uh, and then you have the development of the, the British Sign Language schools in the UK in the 1700s and, and sort of an increasing in focus on the education of deaf children. Um, but as far as medieval and early modern, this is kind of where it stops. So here's my bibliography. I've got uh, a couple of websites. You'll note this is a fairly thin bibliography because as I mentioned, this was a pretty short turnaround on this project, um, but I thought you guys would like to see it. As I said, I would love to get feedback. I've given you here my email, Facebook, website, um, feedback, corrections, suggestions, questions. I would absolutely love to hear from you. Thank you so much for attending my presentation and I hope you guys all have a wonderful day.